Hi everyone, today we're going to be doing a proof and this proof is going to be about when a function is bijective. We'll be proving that a function is bijective if and only if it has an inverse. So there's a couple of pieces of terminology here. One is the word inverse, the other is the word bijective. So we're going to be covering this terminology first. Let's talk about what a bijective function is first. Bijective means two things. One, it means injective. The function is injective. And two, it means the function is surjective. So we've replaced one word with two more words and we need to define what these are, injective and surjective. Let me show you an example of an injective function. Let's say in the domain we have two inputs and in the codomain we have three possible outputs. If this goes, if this maps to this, and this maps to this, this is an injective function because this one got hit only once, and this one got hit only once, and it doesn't matter that this one didn't get hit at all. So the idea is that each element of the codomain gets hit at most once. Surjective is a little bit different. Let me show you an example of this. Let's say we have three elements in the domain and two elements in the codomain. This maps here, this maps here, and this maps here. The idea is that both of these get hit at least once. So over here we have hit at most once and here we have hit at least once. If you put them together you get that bijective functions are those functions where elements of the codomain each get hit exactly once because at least once and at most once come together to mean exactly once. We can make this a little bit more formal using the language of pre-images. So let's say we have a function f going from x to y, then the pre-image of f inverse of y for y an element of big Y is the following set. It's the elements of x such that f of x equals to y. And we can now translate what injective and surjective mean in terms of preimages. Injective means for all y in y, the preimage of little y has less than or equal to one elements and surjective means for all y in y f inverse of y has greater than or equal to one elements and bijective is both it means that for all y in y 
f inverse of y is a singleton, so it has exactly one element. This is going to be pretty important in terms of establishing the theorem that we want to prove. The theorem that we want to prove is that a function is bijective if and only if it has an inverse. So let's define what an inverse is now. An inverse is a function g from y to x. So originally we had f going from x to y, so g reverses the order such that one g is a left inverse of f and two g is a right inverse of f. Uh, once again we've replaced this term inverse with two other terms left inverse and right inverse and now we have to define them just like we had to go from bijective to injective and surjective. So what left inverse means is that g composed over f is equal to the identity function on x which it basically means x always gets mapped to x when you compose g over f and for the right inverse we have that f composed over g is equal to the identity function on y so y always gets mapped to y when we have f of g so this function that's a composition We can actually prove that a function has a left inverse if and only if it's injective and that it has a right inverse if and only if it's surjective, but one of those needs the axiom of choice. Um, we're going to prove that a function is bijective if and only if it has an inverse without the axiom of choice. So let's do that. the function f going from x to y has an inverse g going from y to x if and only if f x to y is bijective. Let's prove this because it's the main meat of our lecture. Suppose f is bijective. We're going to start with this direction. Then we know two things already. One, f is injective and 2 f is surjective. This is going to be useful for us because we know what injective is and we know what surjective is. What we want to do is prove that there is an inverse function. Remember f being injective means for all y in capital Y f inverse of y, the pre-image of y has less than or equal to one element and this means for all y in y f inverse of y has greater than or equal to one element and recall that together this means 
f inverse of y is a singleton like this. So our idea is to define g going from y to x by y maps to this particular x. We have a single y corresponding, single x corresponding to each y. So we're just going to define it that way. And at this point, it's not difficult to verify that a g of f is equal to the identity function on x, that is x goes to x, and b f composed over g is equal to the identity function on y. So y goes to y. So this proves that there exists g going from y to x such that g is a left and right inverse of f. And that means g is an inverse of f. Okay, that proves one direction of our theorem. For the other direction, we want to prove the following. Let's scroll back up so that you can see the statement of the theorem again. We proved this direction and now we want to prove this direction. So we're going to assume that there is an inverse g and we're going to prove that f is bijective. Suppose g going from y to x is a left inverse and a right inverse of f going from x to y. What we want is to show that f is bijective. So injective plus surjective. And the way we're going to do that is to show that one left inverse, the fact that g is a left inverse, implies f is injective. And two, the fact that there exists a right inverse g that implies that f is surjective. Let's, let's do this. It's not too difficult. We're just going to be using the definitions of left inverse and right inverse. So for this one, Suppose f of y1 is equal to f of y2. We want to prove that f is injective, so for this we want, well, in fact, we need that f y1 is equal to y2, otherwise we'll have two different inputs going to the same output. Um, and we can do this by composing g over both sides of this equation. So we get g of f y1 is equal to g of f of y2. And since g is a left inverse, we can get rid of g of f altogether and get y1 is equal to y2. So this proves injectivity. And for the second one, what we're going to do is we want to show that 
for all y in y, there exists an x in x such that f of x is equal to y. And this, this is the meaning of surjectivity. What we'll do is we'll use the right inverse g. So say y is an element of y. We'll let g of y equal to x. And now we can apply f to both sides of this equation. f of g of y is equal to f of x. And now notice that since g is a right inverse of f, we can just put a y over here. So f of x is equal to y. And we, that means we found an x that maps to y. So this proves surjectivity. And that completes the proof. So let's do a quick recap of what we did today. We started by talking about the meaning of bijectivity, which means that it's injective and surjective. I showed you an example of an injective function and an example of a surjective function. We then talked about pre-images and what injectivity, surjectivity, and bijectivity mean in terms of pre-images. I defined what an inverse is, what a left inverse is, and what a right inverse is. And then finally we moved on to the theorem that we wanted to prove, which is that f is bijective if and only if it has an inverse. The way we prove this is first we assume that f is bijective and that allowed us to assume that it is injective and surjective and that means that each preimage of the codomain is a singleton and from this we were able to construct a left inverse and a right inverse and it was the same function g. So g is a true inverse of f. For the other direction, we assume that g is an inverse, so g is a left inverse and a right inverse. And we wanted to prove that f is bijective. So we use the properties of left inverses and right inverses to show that f is injective and that f is surjective. And this allowed us to conclude that the function f is truly bijective. Okay, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.